you're going to drink, so your attention span will be fantastic. Yeah, oh, great. Or, yeah, you need to get me drunk here. Yes, that is the entire yeah. point of this uh, show. Whatever. Listen, you can't take yourself so seriously in these jobs. I mean, you're here today, gone tomorrow. No one's going to suggest that Joe Biden and this administration is sitting and propping up the Iranian regime. That's, as you know, that's your wine speaking. So I'll help you through that. Yeah. Okay, cool. I recently just read the administration's policy on anti-Semitism. Pretty good, don't you think? No. I, I, I oh, come on. Like, you should drink a little bit more wine because you're a hater. I'm, not, I'm a lover. Do you see that fun ambassador Tom Knight is? Hi, welcome to Why With Adam. I'm your host, Adam Scott Bellows, and today we have a very special episode filming from the ambassador's residence in Jerusalem in the German colony. I am here with my very special guest, current sitting ambassador, Tom Nides. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank no, you for honor. having me into your home. It's My a, home is your home, as they like to say. It's gorgeous. You got a gigantic backyard for city, yeah, for yeah. city living. The capital of Israel is Jerusalem, and that's where I am. There you go. So uh, today we're drinking a very special wine. I know that you've actually gone and visited this winery before. It's one of our partner wineries. It's the Tulip Winery. We're drinking the 2020 Frank Merlot Reserve. So, Mr. Ambassador, I'm going to have to ask you, what do you taste and what do you smell ah, before we well, begin? Be, well, first of all, uh, well, kind, I, as they say... Let me let me let me introduce you. <laughs> Ambassador Tom Nides, Midwestern boy. Yes. You're a husband. You're a father. Okay. You're a finance guy. Yeah. Held very high positions in Credit Suisse, Fannie Mae, Morgan Stanley. Yeah. Former Deputy Secretary of State in the Obama administration. And uh current ambassador from the United States. That is all true. Thank you for being online with Adam today. Good. Appreciate it. My honor. Thanks for having me. If people don't know you, the big thing about you is that everybody considers you to be like the biggest men. Yeah. I mean, you get along with everybody, and whenever anybody says something maybe that isn't so nice about you, they usually take it back, which I think is hysterical because yeah, they don't I just know beat you. them up as an issue. Now, listen, <laughs> yeah, listen, 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 when I took the job, I wanted to be open minded with everyone. Listen, I am who I am. Listen, I'm a liberal guy, a liberal Jew from Minnesota, I'm the youngest of eight kids, I'm a secular Jew, and I came here with a very open mind, which was, I wanna meet everyone, and so I met everyone. So let me ask you, what, what's the learning curve been like? You, you're the first, I believe, sitting ambassador to ever have to deal with three different prime ministers <laughs> in a two year period. If you step back, listen, I, I, I had a really, I've been lucky, because again, as, 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 as complicated as this place is, I've gotten along with all three prime ministers. And again, I don't necessarily agree with everyone's politics, but that's okay. Uh, all of them care deeply about Israel, care deeply about the United States of America, the relationship. So I've been lucky. Listen, it's not been perfect. It's been a, it's been an interesting run, and it's been phenomenally uh, rewarding for me as a person to come from Duluth, Minnesota, to Israel. I was going to ask, what's it like for a Midwestern boy to be probably in one of the most important diplomatic posts in America for America? Listen, I am, I am unbelievably lucky, right? And I, and I mean that great. You make your own luck, all that crap. But no, just to be clear, I mean, there's a lot of people who are a lot smarter than I am who have never had the opportunity that I've had. So I'm, listen, I am I wake up every day and I say to myself, listen, as crazy as this place can be and as mind-numbing as it might be some days and the restless nights of sleep, it's a huge honor. Just think about this. You're the ambassador to the most important ally Israel has, that being America, and arguably... America's most important friend, it's certainly in the Middle East, and I would say in the world, that being Israel. So I'm a lucky guy, and it's, you know, and I'm, and I'm fortunate. I got a wife who sort of still likes me. I've got two kids who I know like me as long as I keep giving them money. <laughs> so I think you know, I'm okay. I'm okay. What's been the hardest thing about the learning curve culturally? Um, I just think it is, it is try to get stuff done, right? I mean, I'm a get you kind of done kind of guy. Well, you come from the private sector. Yeah, I come from the private sector, but I've also been the government. I worked on Capitol Hill. I worked for the Clinton administration. I obviously worked for Hillary Clinton at the State Department. I mean, I've, I've spent half my career on Wall Street, half my career in government. So it, it's prepared me, but I like getting things done. And government, as I know, because I've been in government, it's not always the easiest thing to do. Second thing is, I think I knew this intellectually, 
how much people cared about this place. But it's, it is like a level that no one is prepared for here because the lovers, the haters, you know, everyone, everyone cares about this place. And given that, you're on the receiving end of that all the time. And everyone's got an opinion. Everyone wants to express their opinion. And since, as I said earlier, I'm willing to see anyone and talk to anyone, I'm open to have those conversations with folks, which makes the, the job interesting and also complex. So what's, what, what, what's your greatest accomplishment in the last two years, you would say? Well, I, one, I think, is as, as President uh, Biden said when I took the job, we have an unbreakable bond between Israel and the United States. Don't break it. So I got 40 days left. I haven't broken it yet, so that's a big accomplishment. Two, I think it's important that the American ambassador be able to have a good work relationship with three separate prime ministers and to keep that relationship going as, as the person here who's on the ground. And I think I've accomplished that in a, in a pretty positive way. Um, I've continued to articulate the, his, you know, the United States' view, which is we stand by Israel for its security. There's huge threats here, as you know, between Iran, Hamas, you know, uh, Hezbollah. And obviously, I've articulated that over and over again, the importance of that. I spent a lot of time articulating the, the success of the Abram Accords. I give the former administration a huge amount of credit for pulling it off. Huge game changer. So I talk a lot about that. And I spent a lot of time about the Palestinian issue, which is important. Important to, for America. It's important for Israel. How we continue to keep a vision of a two-state solution alive is something that I've spent time on and energy on it. That's the things I care about. I, I, I want to talk about both Iran and the Palestinians, but I want to go back to what you were talking about, which was you, you said your first biggest accomplishment, that you didn't break the alliance. Do you, do you find that, that like people constantly are taking the little things and blowing them up into something bigger? I love the press, okay, but this is what the press dines on, okay? Listen, listen, my wife works for the press, some of my best friends are in the press. I get what sells, okay? What sells and what gets clicks is controversy, Okay. And listen, I've had plenty of controversy. I've been here. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not immune to stirring things up here. Well, I mean, your sh- your ability to be the ultimate schmoozer sometimes get you gets you into cold water, gets you into hot water. Yeah. But it's also why people like you. Yeah, I mean, listen again. I, I, it's not about my, me. It's about trying to keep things at a fairly decent pace and make sure that people don't get carried away with themselves. Listen, you can't take yourself so seriously in these jobs. I mean, seriously. I mean, come on. I mean, you're here today, gone tomorrow. The job's great. It's enjoyable. It's important, but it's not about me. I mean, happen to be here for a period of time. I'll try not to screw things up. I care deeply about this relationship, and consequently, I don't particularly need to get in fights with everyone every day. I mean, it could be. It's very simple for me to do. I don't really feel like it's necessary. Do you think that more diplomats need this type of approach to their jobs? Because, I mean. You come off quite modest in, in what you're doing, even though it's quite grandiose, your job description. Yeah, I think most of my colleagues are like that. I mean, listen, you know, listen, Israel is a special place, okay? You know, you can be an ambassador anywhere in the world. I mean, many of my friends are the ambassadors of different countries. No one's under the microscope that Israel is under. Maybe maybe if you're in Russia or China, but it, the difference in, in Israel, first of all, everyone cares about this place. There's a whole different thing here because... This is a way of life. This is a culture. This is an identity. The, the diaspora community in the United States is, is the foundation of this relationship. And so to me, it's, it's bigger than, the, again, not to be the, I'm not trying to say it in an egotistical way, but this is a, a much bigger deal than many ambassadorships are just by the nature of what you're representing. Do you think the majority of the American people understand what you just said about the civilization, the way of life, the difference in how, or the major difference that Israel is in terms of the relationship with the United States compared to its other allies? Because I, I've never heard a sitting American official ever describe Israel like that before. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I remember how Israel was created. I mean, I mean, think about the state of Israel and, you know, Harry Truman being the first president of the United States to, you know, recognize the state of Israel as a state. Think about the, the, the lot of the, the people who came here 75 years ago. Many of them left uh, uh, parts of Europe because what, they were feeling threatened by the nature of it. They created a Jewish state. This is, this is a remarkable transition and a remarkable place. And then you add on to this, this, con- this emotional connection that you know not, not only just religious Jews, but secular Jews like me have with this place. So there's, this is, there's no other place like this in the world. This, this encompasses everything. This is a, a religion. It's a culture. It's an emotional connection. 
And by the way, it's not just Jews. I mean, Christians and Arabs and, you know, Palestinians. It's a civilization. And, yeah, I just, and so anyway, I don't want to get carried away here. I'm drinking wine. I'm drinking wine. But I, my huh. only, my well, your only passion is, you know, is but beautiful. I just, I, but it's, but it's, it, to me, it's like the real deal. I obviously want to talk about Iran, the new uh, anti-Semitism policy that's come out, your achievements with the Palestinians. You know, Iran is in the news every day, yeah, right now. And uh, recently, Saudi Arabia and Iran had a treaty brokered uh, by China, and yeah. now China is making major inroads, which is not necessarily considered an ally, at the very least, yeah. of the United States. Do you, do you see the encroachment of China in the diplomatic sphere of the Middle East becoming a strategic threat to the United States and the, the strategic partnership between Israel? The answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. The reality of this is, is that the, the Saudis and Iran always had a kind of cold peace for a long period of time, only over the last, you know, handful of years. We got the really, civil war. During the, yeah. the Yemen war, right. which ultimately ended up severing relationships with Saudi. And this, I think, was a the, the impetus behind the Saudis trying to get back to some, what, what some would refer to as a kind of a cold peace. Don't, don't kid yourself. The Sunni Shiite thing is still real. Oh, for sure. Complicated. So, so we, we, again, the, the Israelis and the Americans were aware of what was going on. It wasn't a surprise. I'm not sure you could art articulate that the Chinese brokered it. I think they were a host of the conversation. The rumors are that, that Saudi Arabia did this to poke you guys in the eye because they're unhappy with inconsistencies. I, you know, again, the, you know, a day later after they announced that they bought $35 billion of the planes from Boeing. So I think ultimately, listen, at the end of the day, um, anything that keeps the region calm, we're all for, okay? Ultimately, if the Saudis have a common relationship with the with the Iranians, which which basically puts a truce on the Yemen war, we're all for. Okay. And, and by the way, as I speak for the Israelis too, they have no issue with that piece of it. So the question around the Chinese, Chinese, the Chinese situation around the world is something that obviously the United States is focused on. Focus as a as a military competitor, an economic competitor. Then you talk about the threat of Iran. That's a real threat to the state of Israel. That's one thing obviously I was involved in the JCPOA when I was at the was Secretary Clinton's deputy, so I'm well aware of the importance of of the JCPOA. Obviously, elections have consequences. The former administration ripped up the JCPOA. Now we are where we are. Do you think the JCPOA added to calm in the region, or do you think it did? The I think it's listen again. I I don't like to spend a lot of time saying coulda, shoulda, woulda. Okay. My only question for you, as as someone who you know has watched this a long time. Are we any safer or better off today on the Iran issue uh, than we are when we had the JCPOA? So the question I ask people, first of all, the Iranians have not stopped their nuclear program. The economy in Iran has not collapsed. They're still well, funding I mean, it the proxies. The, it was on the verge of collapse prior to sanctions being relieved by the Biden administration. Well, I, I push you on that a little bit because ultimately the sanctions have not been relieved. That's actually not true. Well, I mean, the reality of this is, the reality of this is- I mean, is, handing them bags of- can. Well, they didn't have any. We never, we never, that was never a cop. We never did that. I believe the threat of Iran is real. Okay. Where are we today? Okay. If you believe what you read in the New York Times, and I always believe what I read in the New York Times, the Iranians are as close to break out as you possibly could get. Yeah, 12 days, uh, 10 weeks ago. Whatever. Still, yeah. They could break out if they so choose one. Two, I think the facts on the ground are the following that the Iranian economy, with sanctions put in place by, enhanced by the Biden administration, we can go through all of that. Has the economy collapsed? The fact of the matter is, where we are today is a very difficult place. I don't really understand the decision making of appeasing a regime that, if it fell, could lead to the stability of the Middle East. Yeah, I don't. I, I'm a little. I, you're wine speaking there because I can't really understand where you're. I'm not really following you where you're going. It's not at all really interesting to me. Here's the bottom line, okay? I'm not exactly sure what all that meant. Here, let's, let's, okay, let's, 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 let, let, let's just let, I'll, I'll let, give it to you so let, that you let, can yeah, let's, cut, let's cut to the chase here. Okay, okay, fine. But the chase is very simple, okay? The President Biden has made it very clear. He's not going to stand by and let the Iranians get a nuclear weapon. Uh -huh. There is a clear view from the Americans' perspective uh, that we are focused on making sure Iran does not get a nuclear weapon. Answering your question is, you know, we, people talk about D's, deterrence, a degradation. Do we believe in the third D? Sure, diplomacy, without question. We're the United States of America. But is that's what we that, that's what we do. Okay, but to be clear, our first and foremost objective is, is to protect the state of Israel to make sure the Iranians don't get a nuclear weapon. That's a pledge that Joe Biden has made. That's been reiterated by every single 
member of the of this cabinet, and that's what we're going to do. Unfortunately, one of the things that isn't taken as seriously anymore is American red lines, given what happened with Syria and, and, okay, and Obama. Okay, I've heard the Syria thing. Why don't you ask Putin about our red line? Why don't you ask Putin about how we, how you know, superpowers don't bluff, my friend, okay? Just ask Putin what's happened. Has there ever been a president since World War II that has been able to rally the world, certainly the NATO allies, to do something they never thought possible, increasing their defense budget, working against their own self-interest, which is, you know, you know, uh, increased fuel prices and gas cut off. I mean, really having huge impacts on the economy for the sole purpose of standing up to a tyrant name, you know, uh, Putin. And that is what, the, and by the way, the, Joe Biden, like him or hate him, you know, agree with him, disagree with him. I don't know. Him, he, so. has ra- he has rallied the world, including the Congress, to not only fund this, but also bring the NATO along. Think about what some of these countries have done. They dramatically have increased the defense budgets, which they haven't done in 30 years. So I think, again, the superpowers don't bluff, and we don't bluff. Well, but think about that. But we did, you did bluff. What? With Syria. Okay. Again, just to be clear, I, I, I could spend a lot of time unwinding the clock. I don't think it's healthy for you or for me. Okay. Because, I mean, it might be for a couple of glasses <laughs> of wine. But my point is very simple. Uh, this administration has stands. It, it right in the center of making sure that okay. we support the security of the state of Israel. I completely Focus understood. Focus on the Iranian threat and Hezbollah. Totally understand. And on Hamas. But, That's what we do. Right. But in terms of the Iranian people, yes, is the current administration doing what's best for them by allowing this, you know, eschatological, apocalyptic regime stay to stay in power and by propping them up and cutting diplomatic deals well, with but, them? Well, I... I'm I mean, not, I, you're, I'm not, I'm you're not, a husband. I, I don't think anyone's going to suggest. You're a husband I don't and think, a I don't, father. I don't, think, I don't think anyone's going to suggest that our administration is propping up the Iranian regime. Are they helping tear them down? Uh, I think I think it's quite I'm not going to explain to you all the things that we do or don't do. I'll let other people do that. But I think it's I think it's clear no one's going to suggest that Joe Biden and this administration is sitting and propping up the Iranian regime. That's, as you know, that's your wine speaking. So I'll help you through that, but we'll get we'll get through that. Okay, cool. All right, I wanna I wanna talk about um, the Abraham Accords and the Palestinians and the two state solution. Where are we today with a possible peace with the Palestinians, or is the American government more focused on peace with Saudi Arabia in order to push the Palestinians? Well, let's, let's again let's try to unwind this a little. First sure. of all, I, I've been an enormous supporter of the Abraham Accords, as you know. Yeah. First, it's my, like you, it's been your thing no, no, since but you I, got but there. I, and again, just because it was done by the Trump administration doesn't mean that we can't support it. Now we've supported sure. it, uh, we've advanced it. I like to joke that they gave us a startup and we tried to make it a real company. Nice. Uh, and I think that, and I give a, a Jared and a David Friedman and the, pre, the former president the credit for doing this and Netanyahu for doing it because I think it changed diplomacy in the Middle East uh, for the better. Uh, and hopes that we can build on that. We get other countries involved. We could talk about Saudi Arabia in a minute. But I think it's really important, right? Anything yeah. that gets, anything that keeps the 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 peace and keeps the culture together and keeps kind of the this this bind between the countries together is a is a big win for Israel and for the Middle East. Now, the Palestinian issue. Mm-hmm. Listen, I I think it is. I wish in my next forty days that I'd be able to get the Nobel Peace Prize for Tuesday Solution. Hey, hey, Probably, never, hey, never say I mean, never. Close, never close, say never. Close, close, but I did, but that's my my view. Of this is that the the issue is you can't want peace more than the parties want peace. I think the United States is constantly in the position of advocating. Listen, I've I said a hundred times, I'm for a two state solution, sixty seven borders. I care deeply about the long term. Listen, guess what's going to happen, folks? You know the you know. The Arabs aren't going anywhere. The Palestinians aren't going nor the Jews. Okay, one hundred percent. Seven million of them and seven million Jews. They're not going anywhere. So we need to figure this out. Okay, we need to figure it out because they're going to be living side by side, and we need to figure it out over the long haul. In the meantime, one of the things my priorities have been since I've been here is to work on behalf of not only the security of the state of Israel, which is I start on this, but also to make sure that we try to help the Palestinian people. Not the PA that I forget the PA. I mean, I don't mean forget, but that's not what I'm worried about. I'm work, I'm focusing the Palestinian people. That's why I focus on healthcare, the Allenby Bridge, 4G. I mean, this is really, these have been huge accomplishments. I, so but my you. point, my only point is, I think what people lose in the sauce here is everyone's chasing this idea of uh, what success looks like, and the success looks like a two state solution. Well, 
Again, I think that's a good vision. I hope at some point I'll be sitting here listening and reading it. In the meantime, we got to be helping because the average Palestinian, the vast majority of Palestinians wake up every day and want the same thing you and I uh-huh. kids would want. They want to like put food on the job, table. They, they want, want opportunity. They want security. They want all the same sure. crap. And so my view of this is that's what I've been trying to do without compromised security of the state of Israel. Okay, That's first and foremost in my mind. And as a guy who's gone to 36 shiva calls of, of, of Israelis, families whose children or someone loved one has been killed by a terrorist, no one's going to question my commitment to the security of the state of Israel and the people. So I get that. Uh-huh. But that doesn't mean you can not keep this place secure. At the same time, trying to make sure that the Palestinian people, the people are getting some of the opportunities to, because, you know, hate, you know, hate breeds hate and you want to, you want to break the cycle of it. So you said hate breeds hate. Yes. And one of the things that the administration that you you are representing yes. has decided to refund UNRWA without them changing their textbooks. And if you and if you look at the educational curriculum that is given to the average Palestinian child, there there are even math problems that are if Ahmed kills one Jew and and Fatima kills two Jews, okay, how many dead Jews are there? Yeah. Listen, I mean, like, listen, no, but, no, but no one, this, no, no one could ever. But isn't this the? No, no, no wait, 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 hold wait, on, wait, 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 Ambassador, isn't this, isn't this kind of conflict resolution, one hundred and one that you guys are breaking the rules of here? Okay, well, let's step back. Unrest for a very important role, especially around refugees, uh, um, both healthcare, education, welfare. Someone's got to step in and do this. Okay, and if, and if there's not UNRWA, guess who's going to be doing this? Israel. Okay. And the last time I checked, they are not really anxious to do this. So the fact of the matter is, UNRWA is not perfect. And I would not be standing here and saying, oh my God, everything they do is great. But they do the vast majority of the work they do, which is really on you know living conditions and clean water and health care, is very important. But don't don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right, but don't... at the same time, you, you just, you, you did... You... I, I believe, and, and, and you also said hate breeds hate. Yes. And, and if, if this would have been a condition as part of the Oslo Accords, I mean, you would, have a, you would have an entirely generation. I mean, look at what is happening on a college campus. If you look at the antagonism that is given to Jewish students, if you listen to the things that are chanted at Jewish students on college campuses, they are slogans and ideas that have come from the you know radicalized Palestinian groups that are here in the West Bank and Gaza. I, I agree okay. with you that the what's going on, on college campuses is an is an epidemic. Okay, it's an epidemic, and and I think ultimately what worries me more than anything is is that is a you know someone who's Jewish has a hard time standing up and talking about Israel in a way that the, you would want to have happen on college campuses. Well, I mean, there's there's constant threat of physical violence. I mean, it's it. Listen, I, I in every speech I, I, give, I was one of those. Every every, one time. every speech I give, I talk about. Listen, we need a Marshall Plan for college campuses. We need to figure out what moves college campuses. There's a couple reasons for this. One is obviously, you know, college kids are always for the underdog, and there's a perception that the Palestinians are the underdog. So that's inherently part of the thing. You can be, you can stand up on a college campus and say, "Listen, I am pro-Israeli." And pro the Palestinian people. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, but you can't actually do that. Well, why not? Well, I mean, why not? Well, I, I mean, mean I, think, I, think, is, I think I think well, a great, I, I think a great I example is wait, wait, wait. that's what I am. I'm the American master right, of Israel. But I, I am pro Israel. Right. No one's that, more pro Israel than I am, and I'm also pro the Palestinian people. And we have to figure out a way for college kids to be able to talk about this the right way. We also have to figure out how we educate people. But if you look at even what just happened at this Sunni law graduate that made you know international news about the speech that she gave at her commencement ceremony. As Israel continues to indiscriminately rain bullets and bombs on worshipers, murdering the old, the young, attacking even funerals and graveyards as it encourages lynch mobs to target Palestinian homes and businesses as it imprisons its children, as it continues its project of settler colonialism, expelling Palestinians from their homes, carrying the ongoing Nakba, that our silent is no, that our silence is no longer acceptable. It's very clear that it's impossible to be seen as pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian. You, you can't soundbite things. Right? I'm coming from my experience as a former student in the post-Second Lebanon War. I, I mean, I mean, think about it. Even, you know, I recently just read the administration's policy on anti-Semitism. Pretty good, don't you think? No, I died. Oh come on, you're the only person I've heard that. There's not a, there's the word, not a, wait a minute, hold on. The word Zionism wasn't even in there. The word Islamophobia was in there 
17 times. Can I ask you a question? Have I, you I, ever it, in your lifetime I, I mean, seen a 67-page report on anti-Semitism not only funded, have administration support, cabinet approval? Have you ever in any administration in the it history doesn't address, of mankind- It doesn't address the main aspects of where anti-Semitism is coming from. It doesn't talk about radical Islam. It only mentions white supremacy. It, it doesn't. It doesn't mention the other side of the aisle's anti-Semitism. There is very few. I, people. I mean, I think it's a great uh, step forward. Well, okay, but, okay, but, but but it doesn't. I mean, it solve just anti-Semitism. Be, you're right. It definitely doesn't solve anti-Semitism, and it doesn't fully address the full encompassing problem of what anti-Semitism truly is today. And I think that that is a problem. Also, care is involved. I, I mean, like these are these are important things. As I stand back and say to myself, "Wow." This administration just put out a 70-page report with money, with con- with with agreements by cross ideological spectrum, in a way in a in a way that's never happened in the history of mankind. Just think about this for a minute. Has there ever been an administration, the former administration, the Trump administration, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration? This is the first administration. Is it? Is it the end all of the be all for everyone? Of course, there has been a heavy increase of anti Semitism in the United totally States agree that stems from one thing anti Zionism. And, and in your report, in the administration, not your report, in the administration's report, the term Zionism or anti Zionism is not used once. But I think the biggest mistake that both the previous administrations made, both Obama and Trump, and I, and I find this very interesting, and I and I hate this about both administrations. One wouldn't say radical Islam. You're one wouldn't say. Can't be a hater, I'm not a man. hater. You have to be a hater. You're a little hater. Look, I'm not being. Look, I'm not being. You should drink a little bit more. I'm, like, you're a a more more I'm, not, I'm a lover. Do you and you're know a hater. what you're fun and bastard, Tom Knight? You're a hater and I'm a lover, and that's the difference between you and me. That's what happens. No, but one side couldn't say radical Islam. The other side couldn't say white supremacy. And what, what, where what, the 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 result is that we're not actually creating a full encompassing policy that will actually defeat both sides Listen, of the issue. I, 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 so, as, I, as I said to you, point in. Yeah. I'm not looking for nirvana, folks. I'm not looking for nirvana. You want nirvana? You're not drinking enough. You're not, you want to look, you I don't look care for, what you're, you, you're, you're not going to get nirvana if you you're, don't drink. You're, you're looking for nirvana. I'm just looking for sensibility. No, I'm, I'm just looking for I, a I movement and dial. No, I'm not looking for that. I want to look for a world where Jews are safe to live anywhere in the world. Oh, me too. That's, that's not, what I, I want. High five for that. I agree with you. Let's move to Saudi Arabia. Okay. Like, let's have some fun. Good. Sounds great. You, you made an awesome quote that got picked up yesterday. It was all over the Israeli press and the English press as well. What if we woke up tomorrow and there was a normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia? I had a tingle in my fingers. And, like, and, like, and like would, you knew and, something that we all and, didn't and know. Be, and then I said, wouldn't it be grand? Wouldn't it be grand? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. We, I said, wouldn't it be great? You said, wouldn't it be grand, which yeah. is even cooler. Yeah. Realistically, Timeline wise, do you think it can be done before the next election? I mean, I mean uh, is, I think, it, is this moving along? Well, again, I who knows? Ultimately, I mean, it's I'm hoping moving. you know. Well, I know a little bit, but I got to shoot you if I told you. But I think it is. Give me, give me, give me, give me a scale of one to ten. Possible, not possible. I don't do realistic. numbers. I don't do numbers. I, I will just give me the, the odds. The, the the chances of you know you know listen. Anything that's big and complicated like this takes time and energy, and ultimately this administration will work to try to see if we can get this done. What do you think is the most misunderstood thing about Israel vis-a-vis the United States? Uh, this is a melting pot, folks. This is, this is, this is, look, think about this country. This is, there's seven, there's, there's nine million people living in Israel, Greenland Israel, okay? Of the, of the nine million, two million are not Jews. They're Druze, they're, they're Palestinian Israelis, they're Arabs. It's, it's a melting pot. It's a beautiful place. When people say to me, and I said this yesterday at the ADL meeting, when people say, oh my God, democracy is ending in Israel. What are you talking about? Look what's going on here. If, regardless do, of your do you foreign, think it's been blown listen, out? Listen, listen, no, no, listen to this. Let's think about this for a minute. Regardless what side of the, the, the yeah. ledger you're on on the judicial reform, 150 to 250,000 people have come out every Saturday, which would be the equivalent of six to seven million Americans coming to the mall. Okay, There's been no violence. Personally, no one's been arrested, no property damage. And arguably, it's worked. Arguably, it's gotten people to slow down and look and to determine. Forget, forget. It's beautiful, you know, in my opinion. And this is what's it's very democ- beautiful. This is where is another country like this in the world? Even the United States, we haven't been able to do that. Yeah. Look at Paris. They try to move the, the retirement age by two years. What do you think is the most misunderstood thing about the United States vis-a-vis Israel? Um, 
you know, I think that people, it's okay to criticize, to be, it's okay when, when Americans, you know, politicians, other people criticize Israel. Now, if you cross the line and you become an anti-Semitic, we should crush you like a bug. But just because someone stands up and says Israel is not perfect doesn't mean that the American, you know, uh, the Democrats or liberal Republicans are against Israel. That's ridiculous. We're a democracy. Israel is a democracy. People can speak their mind. People can articulate things. That's what makes the beauty. That's, that's what binds our countries together, these democratic values. That's pretty cool. Final question. Uh, I'm getting ready. This is what I ask every guest that comes on. I want you to picture me like I'm 13 years old. I'm getting ready for my bar mitzvah. And you have the opportunity to teach me everything that I should learn or could learn from you based on your life experience. What would that be? Be open-minded. Be open-minded. Be willing to talk to people you disagree with. I, 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 I remind people, I literally, um, two months ago, David Friedman, who was my predecessor, there's very little I agree with David Friedman politically, okay? He came and sat right in this chair right here, and he came to sit with me and he said, hey, do you want to, I have an idea, would you co-chair with me the March of the Living? And I said, okay. He goes, don't you have to call the White House? I said, why, David? This is about fighting the anti-Semitism. I don't need to agree with you on your politics, but I'm open-minded enough to believe in it. Well, let me just tell you something. Of all the things I've done here in my two years, that was the most significant thing I did. I went, I'd never been to Auschwitz. Went from Auschwitz to Birkenau, you know, holding David's hand, Miriam Adelson, Bob Kraft. It was remarkable. So from my perspective, that's how I've conducted my life. Listen, I'm not perfect. I've been really lucky. I think ultimately part of my, my, my who I am is I like people. I, I want to hear from people regardless if I agree with them or disagree with them. It's okay. It's okay. And that's what I think that's life about. I want to say thank you to our, our, our audience for watching today. Uh, today we're, we're drinking the Tulip Frank Merlot 2020 from the Tulip Winery. Like I said, it's a delicious wine. If you like the wine that we're drinking, you can find it at wineofthevine.org. And if you want to plant a vine with the Tulip Winery, you can do that at wineofthevine.org slash JNS. Today we were sitting with Ambassador Tom Nides in Jerusalem in the Ambassador's Residence. Tom, thank you so much for joining well, me. I'm I, honored. You're, you're, you're here. Thanks. I thanks, mean, man. Really, <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Thanks.